Carl Blake is a partner and employment law expert at DLA Piper and he's here to talk to me for this week's Toil and Trouble instalment about vaccine injury claims to ACC and the pending law change granting protection to dependent contractors. Carl, let's start with the ACC data. Um, what is this data showing? Yeah, so ACC has released information relatively regularly following our uh, vaccine rollout plan uh, back in 2021, just to show the the impact of the um, the, the negative imp- side effects, if you like, of the vaccine that were um, now being able to be seen more uh, fulsomely because we've had so many vaccinations administered. Um, just for a brief, back- brief background, in 2005, the ACC laws were changed away from the concept of medical misadventure. That's now called a treatment claim, and effectively, it's a claim resulting from something that is administered to you by a medical professional that has an outcome that's not expected. And it also excludes um, outcomes that are based on your um, pre-existing medical conditions. So if there's something in your um, medical history that creates a particular reaction, that might be a reason why ACC would not accept a claim. So this is, all of the claims that have been accepted and declined um, have been published in relation to the ones that have made it through. Right. And, Mm. you know, this data must be sort of coming to an end, mustn't it? Because, I mean, vaccines are basically being done. Yes, that's a good point. So this is why I think now, and um, looking at the the information, a staggering, you know, over 11 million vaccines have now been administered. And they, um, the, the, the data shows quite clearly how many people have had what. But yes, you're right. You can see now with the waning number of boosters, effectively that's, um, uh, well, scientifically rolling out the need for them is, is reducing. And also, I think society's willingness to participate in ongoing vaccination seems to have successfully run its course broadly. They're still happening, but yes. I think we can expect that number not to be increasing significantly from this point. So you said 11 million mm-hmm. vaccines have been given and some... 1,200 or so claims have been accepted um, as sort of vaccine injuries, so to speak. Um, the main one, the, the biggest, is allergic reaction, which mm. is understandable. The next is sprain. Yeah, look, they don't. <laughs> I would like to have seen an asterisk by that to what that might actually mean in practice. Oh, look, I'm not sure. I, I can't imagine um, what could have result from that. But look, it's number two on the list. Um, number three, I guess, is a bit more of a concern. It's cardiac injury. Yeah. Um, now, look, from the outset, all of the vaccine um, providers did list the potential impacts on, on, on the cardiovascular system as one. And look, there it is there at number three. Mm. Um, and then contusion is, is the fourth. And then it just peters down into um, other small um, minor reactions. Yeah, that's right. And payments. Now, um, this chart seems to tell a bit of a tale. Yes, yeah, so we've got a, a hugely heavily weighted... Um, over 50% of the claims appear to be paying out uh, up to $500 maximum. And you think of it um, in the scheme of, of ACC, that's very low. Mm. Um, on the other hand, the, there are a small pocket of claims. We've got 65 in which ACC has paid over $10,000 to a claimant. Wow. And that does reflect um, that for some people, um, that there has been a more serious impact. And I suppose in Looking at again in, in a statistical con- context, 65 again out of the 11 million. I mean, it's it's really um, it's it's statistically significant, but also <laughs> significant yeah. that it's so low. And it's great that it's so low. It is. It is great. Why is it important for employers to sort of know the data or have an idea about it? Well, I think it's a couple of things. One, it's um, in, in some respects, it's a it's a reflection or a, a reinforcement, if you like, on the fact that the program has worked broadly. Mm. Um, yes, you will, we all remember the, the vocal um, opposition uh, yes. from some pockets um, to the vaccine rollout and the, uh, depending on what social media channels you followed, you thought the scale would be falling. Um, that's proved not to be the case and these statistics back that up. I think from an employer's perspective, um, interestingly, and I haven't seen data on this, but there is actually a page on the ACC website to say that if you think your staff have contracted COVID-19 as a result of their work, it could be a work-related personal injury. Now that's separate to this. This is this is treatment injuries yes. from the vaccine. vaccine. I, I would actually be very interested in, in the data on those who have 
contracted COVID-19 as a result of their work when it's clearly so difficult to define where someone contracted that. I think that was probably a lot easier back in the days when we had single-digit numbers. Yes. Now I, I suspect that would be nearly impossible, impossible. to determine. And has there been mm. any case law in New Zealand that you not, know of? Not that so we've seen, no. It hasn't been tested no. yet. And I don't think it will mm. because now, I mean, think of the, the, the burden of proof. To prove that you contracted COVID-19 from yes. your work, you'd have to essentially prove you had no contact with any others in any other capacity <laughs> but your workplace. It's very difficult. Mm. Um, now, let's talk about better mm. protections for contractors. Putting aside Uber, which we have covered in quite a lot of detail recently, can you tell us a little bit about what is what other sectors are looking at with this? Yes, yeah, so we've got, um, in 2021, we had a tripartite Group, so we've got the the triangle between government, unions, um, and Business New Zealand, saying, look, how can we look at the issues of contractor versus employee? It's a vexed issue. It's one that's um, kept employment lawyers and the courts busy forever. Um, <laughs> having said that, uh, it's not one that I think necessarily needs to be changed. And what, why I say that is that there are various tests that have evolved through the years in case law as to and and the IRD as to is someone a contractor or an employee. And they focus on the things that all employment lawyers and a lot of employees will already know about. Like what level of control do I have over someone? Is someone integrated into our business or not? Are they performing work truly on their own account or is it for us? And effectively, are they in business on their own account? Are they self-employed? And in some cases, that's very easy. You know, you might have a, a plumbing business where you employ five or six people. You're the head of that business. You choose who to work for, where to work, um, what jobs you'll take, what you won't. If you do extra hours or something more efficiently, you'll profit from that. If you do substandard work, you might have to fix it at your own cost. You know, it's a, it's a very simple model. Then you get a bit grey as to someone who's brought on as a contractor, but effectively is doing the same kind of work as an employee. They might mm. sit on the side, they may do things slightly differently, but maybe they're given a company uniform and maybe they're given an email yes. address with your business name on it. And maybe they're doing the same hours as your employees and maybe they can't work for others, and maybe if they work extra hard one day, they still get the same rate. And it's that is the issue of are, are they really a contractor? Now, why that's important, of course, is that um, there are there's pros and cons from both sides here, but the most common one is that if you're a contractor, employment laws do not apply to you at all, apart from things like health and safety, which you can't contract out of, but holidays, um, uh, um things like minimum entitlements, the protections most importantly under the Employment Relations Act to be able to be dismissed uh, for cause only don't apply to you. So uh, in a pure contracting model, subject to what's in the contract, you can say to someone, it's not working out, we're terminating contract. No reasons uh, have to be given, no cause, no misconduct, and someone's uh, contract can be terminated. Now, in a, in a model where this commercially arm's length and this equal bargaining power, that's just business. In a situation where someone's highly um, disadvantaged and they don't have equal bargaining power, then that may be a problem. But the courts already can recognise that if someone's been dismissed and they feel they're an employee, there are avenues and have always been for them to say, actually, I think I'm an employee. I'd like the Employment Relations Authority to determine that, please. And they do. And they're well equipped to do that. Um, so it was a bit of a surprise for us to see uh, a review that looks at making this more of the, uh, the a, 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 a statutory decision. Um, so we're looking at a imminent law change which will actually codify some of these tests and make it a statutory issue as to whether someone's a contractor or an employee. Um, now that has, as I say, pros and cons. What, what about the... Uh, so I, I get that it will assist potentially some people who don't have the ability to potentially know this an issue, um, to be able to challenge it themselves because they might not have the means or the understanding. Um, but what about the, the, the self-employed person who um, has a number of tax benefits um, in writing expenses off um, mm. to, uh, or GST, and the, the things that work perfectly for them as a contractor, the flexibility, the ability to work a, as and when they please, they might not want to be labelled an employee mm. and to have the courts not be able to decide that, but rather a statute. So do you mm. think this um, is, is leading towards far fewer contractors overall? Uh, yeah, I think this would have to be a one-way street. I can't see when this law comes through, if it does in its current perceived form, that it would have any other impact than to create more employees than there currently are out of the contractor pool. 
And it would be those ones on the, in the fringes. I'm hoping that the law would not look at the, the obvious model I've talked about where there's a clear uh, equality of bargaining power, where there's a genuine desire for, to be a contracting model. It's those that are on the fringes where it's actually, am I really on business on my, account, on my own account? Am I really self-employed? Or, um, and I think some of the examples used in the, in the guidelines where do I wear a company uniform or am I an apprentice? I know that there are only two examples of a very big matrix of facts. But effectively, in those scenarios, it might be that the bar is being lifted to capture those in the in the grey area to create a third category, really. So you've got employees, independent contractors, and dependent contractors, which depend on one business for all of their work, mm. and are really just employees dressed in a different way.